Hi everyone and welcome to today's lecture on sex chromosomes and chromosome mutations and I apologize for ruining your childhood with this hilarious meme on this first slide. So the first thing that I want to talk about in this lecture is sexual dimorphism and this basically refers to the differences between biological sexes of male versus female and please keep in mind this is different from gender or identification. So what we're going to look at is primary sexual differentiation versus secondary sexual differentiation. So when you talk about primary sexual differentiation, this is specific to the formation of gender specific gonads, which produce gametes. And so your gonads are, for instance, the testes for, for males or the ovaries for females. And so that would be primary, whereas secondary sexual differentiation is the overall difference in outer appearance or um, things that are included in this little figure here. So for instance, breast formation, pubic hair development, changes in voice and skin, uh, overall muscle changes. Basically think of these as the things that you will see occurring during puberty, okay? So primary differentiation you're going to see in terms of development in, in, in the fetus, whereas secondary will be overall changes that can even occur in um, puberty. Now, when we talk about this differentiation, one of the things I want to emphasize is X versus Y chromosomes and what they're going to be coding for. So when you see the Y chromosome, and that was originally thought to be genetically empty. Okay, And so they didn't think that there were any genes on there that would be coding for anything or anything of value. Uh, and I can make so many jokes about that, but I will refrain. And when you look at the Y chromosome, it's much, much smaller than the X chromosome. It only has about 75 genes, whereas you're going to see in a little while that the X chromosome has at least 900 to 1400 genes. Okay, so the Y is a itty bitty little chromosome. And when you look at the parts of the Y, you have the PAR, the SRY, and this SRY is part of the MSY. And so the meaning of these abbreviations is over here. You have first the pseudo-autosomal region, then the sex-determining region Y, and the male-specific region of the Y. And uh, when you look at the PAR, what I want to point out that's important about that part is that it actually shares some homology with regions of the X chromosome. And that's significant because it sh if it shares homology with the X chromosome, you can actually have recombination occur between an X and a Y chromosome. Okay, and, and so 95% of the Y chromosome cannot do this. Okay, only this little PAR region here has similarities to the X chromosome. Now, the rest of this, what I want to emphasize here, the MSY, um, basically you'll see different regions within it. You see euchromatin, you see heterochromatin. Uh, that just talks about, um, basically you can think of it as repressive versus active genes. So whenever you see heterochromatin, and we'll go over this in more detail in, in a later lecture, that's basically a repressive state of DNA. So it's going to be lacking active genes, whereas euchromatin, those regions, they have active functional genes. But the part of the MSY that I want you to circle star highlight is the SRY, because that portion the SRY encodes a protein called testes determining factor, the TDF, and that causes the undifferentiated gonadal tissue of embryo to form the testes. So the SRY is going to code for the protein that allows for primary differentiation and formation of testes.
That then brings us to the X chromosome. And like I said, the X chromosome is massive compared to the little old tiny Y chromosome. There are at least 900 to 1400 genes in the X chromosomes. And what's interesting when you think about that many genes, and then you see the point that females have two X chromosomes, well then that could be a problem, can it? Because if you picture that the XY organism is going to have huge amount of X genes for one chromosome, and then the other is tiny with like 75 genes, and then the female, that's going to have two chromosomes each with 900 to 1400 genes. That would be a major discrepancy, a huge amount of genes and proteins being expressed. So females, because they have the 2X chromosomes, you need some form of dosage compensation. Okay, you're going to want to inactivate one of the X chromosomes to kind of balance out uh, the, the amount of genes that you have that can be expressed. And what that basically, uh, that dosage compensation requires is X inactivation forming what's called bar bodies. So bar bodies are inactivated X's, okay? And basically all X chromosomes except for one have to be inactivated because you just want one X chromosome. So, you know, think of it as making it comparable to an XY that only has one X chromosome. So if you, let's say, have um, one X, you're not going to have, sorry, over here, if you have one X chromosome, you're not going to have any bar bodies, okay? And the way you can calculate the number of bar bodies is N minus one. And so N is the number of X chromosomes. So in this case, you have one X chromosome. So that's either here or here. You, you only have one X chromosome. So that will be one minus one is zero no bar bodies. <clears throat> so a male, for instance, with XY will not have any bar bodies. Then if you have two X chromosomes, either an XX or an XXY, so both of those have two Xs, then you would have two minus one, you would have one bar body. Here, if you have XXX, triple X, <laughs> If you have that, you would have three minus one, which gives you two bar bodies. Okay, so you only want one X active. The rest of them are inactive called bar bodies. The way to figure out the number of bar bodies, simply take the total number of X chromosomes and subtract one. Okay, so when we look at X chromosome inactivation, what's really interesting is that in some organisms, rather than all of the cells having the same X that gets inactivated, in some organisms, they'll have two different X's, you know, they'll, they'll have different alleles for, for let's say, color of, of fur on, on the two different X's, and then in different cells, which X gets inactivated ends up varying. So in one cell, for instance, in this picture here, this, this cat, in their, within their two Xs, one has the coding for orange fur, one has for black fur. And, you know, in one cell, it may be that the black fur is inactivated. So instead you see orange and in another cell, you'll end up having the orange get inactivated. So you'll see black over there. And that's how you get things like calico cats. So make sure on this slide to write down that calico cats are from X inactivation. So they're females, okay? Now, when we look at this, this is controlled by a gene called EXIST. So that's X-I-S-T, which you see over here. Now, whether or not that EXIST gene is active can affect which X is now inactivated. 
So basically, X inactivation is controlled by the methylation of that exist gene. If that exist gene on the X chromosome is methylated, then that gene is inactive, okay? If the exist gene is not methylated and it's active, what it does, which is seen over here, is it codes for a really long non-translated RNA, meaning a really long piece of RNA that doesn't code for anything. Instead, what that RNA does is it coats the outside of that particular X chromosome. When it coats it, it is now going to block that X chromosome and it's going to recruit repressive silencing proteins. So it will inactivate that X. So you can think of the exist gene as having an inverse relationship with the X chromosome. If exist is inactive, that X chromosome will be active right? Because there's no repressive exist RNA produced. If the exist gene is active, it produces that repressive RNA, and now that X is inactive, okay? So if exist is active, the X chromosome is inactive. If exist is inactive, the X chromosome is active, okay? So that's the two possibilities uh, that we see here. So now that's the background of the sex chromosomes. And unfortunately, there are a lot of aberrations, meaning, you know, problems that can occur, differences from the, the normal expectation that can end up happening. And so sometimes, for instance, you can have an extra X. You can have just one X and no second sex chromosome, so no X or Y second here. You can have triple X. Again, that one makes me laugh every time because I'm a child. Uh, and then you can have a double Y in addition to the X or something called fragile X syndrome. And that's the one that you may have heard of more often with that one that's caused by the FMR1 gene. You end up having these trinucleotide repeats that expand the size of that particular gene, the FMR1 gene. And so you end up having uh, modifications and methylation and all that that should not occur. And you end up with the inactivation of the gene, which causes you to lose the normal product of that gene, which happens to be a protein in the brain. And so you end up seeing cognitive problems in fragile X syndrome, whereas with some things, you don't even realize that you have these abnormalities in your chromosomes until, let's say, you do something like karyotyping or you're looking to have children and you do genetic testing. Now, when we talk about mutations, everyone's always very scared of mutations and they see it as, you know, a scary, horrible thing. It's come to mean, you know, a bad thing. This is not the case. Mutations simply mean a change in a cell's genetic material, meaning you have a change in the sequence of the DNA. Now, most people think of mutations and they think, oh, they're all bad. In fact, most mutations are actually neutral, okay? Circle star highlight the fact that most mutations are neutral. Most of the time, there are a ton of mutations that occur in your cells and your sequence, uh, sequences of DNA that you never notice. There is no change in the phenotype. There's no change in function. So most mutations are neutral. The thing is, that harmful ones are the most noticeable one. So if, for instance, you see a baby born without any legs, any arms, suddenly that's going to be very noticeable to you. It's going to be memorable. It's going to be, you know, something that really stands out to you. And so that makes people think that, you know, 
harmful mutations are more common than they are, when in fact harmful mutations are actually very rare. And if you think about it, they're rare because they tend not to carry on. If a mutation is going to be detrimental and kill an organism early, for instance, that organism doesn't get to reproduce. So that mutation ends up lost. And also harmful mutations, uh, sometimes they end up not even to be too much of a problem either or too noticeable because you have two copies, two alleles of each gene. Remember, one from mom, one for dad. So you can end up having a healthy one compensate for it. Uh, on the other hand, similar to that, beneficial mutations are also rather rare compared to the neutral ones. Uh, but these get, you know, they're more likely to be evolutionarily uh, preserved or maintained. They carry on because beneficial ones, they increase survival. If you increase survival, that means you're more likely to reproduce and that gets passed down, uh, particularly or specifically if it is in the germline. And that simply means your sex cells, your gametes, which are sperm or egg, if However, a mutation occurs in a somatic cell, such as, you know, a skin cell, that's only going to be passed down to future skin cells in that organism. It's not going to be passed down to the offspring. So, for instance, you know, if, if you end up with a mutation in your skin cell that turns that patch of skin a darker color, well, your child is not going to have that darker color in that particular spot. It will only be your cells, your future cells in that spot that get that mutation. Now, when we talk about mutations, when we have chromosome mutations, um, most diploid species will contain two haploid chromosome sets. So if you have 46 pairs of chromosomes, the, the diploid number is 46. The haploid number is 23. It's half of that. Okay. Now variations from the pattern of, you know, having diploid versus haploid chromosome sets, that will be a chromosome mutation or an aberration, like I mentioned before. And we're going to go through some of them. Basically, it's a change in total number of chromosomes or within certain chromosomes, you may have a deletion or insertion of genes. You may have duplications of genes or even rearrangements of genes getting moved around or parts of the sequence moved around. Now, that first example that I just gave a moment ago where I said you can have variations in chromosome number, uh, when you think of that, uh, humans, it's usually not tolerated very well in humans or, or animals when you have a variation in chromosome number. So, for instance, if you're supposed to have 46 uh, total, you know, diploid number of chromosomes and suddenly you have 45, that's usually going to be a problem. If you had half of that, that would be a really big problem or double that in an animal in a human, that would be a very big problem, okay? Interestingly, it works okay in plants, usually. So it can have dramatic effects uh, on phenotype when it's animals and humans, but in plants, polyploidy actually seems to work out pretty well. And so on this chart, when you see N, N is the haploid number of chromosomes. And then, you know, for instance, 2N, that would be twice the haploid number. So, for instance, our haploid number would be 23. 2N in humans, our diploid number, would be 46. Now, one of the things that can have a dramatic effect that causes chromosomal variations is cause, called non-disjunction. And so when you break down this word, disjunction is what happens in anaphase of the cell cycle. So when you have um, the, the chromosomes are supposed to be pulled apart to the two polar opposite sides of the, the cell before it splits, 
Well, what can happen in non-disjunction instead of those halves of the chromosomes, you know, the sister chromatids getting separated and half going to one side, half going to the other side, what can happen is some of them end up staying together. And so now you'll see the two daughter cells are not going to have the proper amount of chromosomes in the end. And so all steps be beyond this point are going to be a major problem. Okay, and it can happen at different points in meiosis. And either way, you can end up with some issues. So if non-disjunction occurs right at the start of meiosis, so the first anaphase, you end up having none of the final uh, offspring are going to be okay here. No, sorry, none of the final gametes are going to be okay. Whereas when you have it happen in the second meiotic division, you notice that this side of the chart, everything turned out the way it's supposed to be. It's only on this side. So two out of the four gametes are going to have mutations, but two would be perfectly fine, you know, normal amounts. Now, when we talk about chromosomal issues and abnormalities, uh, one of the aberrations that can happen is monosomy. And examples of this includes Turner syndrome. So what you see here, monosomy of the X chromosome in female humans, it's written as 45X because you are missing an X here. So instead of 46 chromosomes, there are 45 now because you're missing one of them. It is frequently lethal when autosomal in animals. And remember, humans are animals. So basically, if anywhere in a chromosome, you have a single lethal uh, allele existing, there's no longer a way to mask it because there's not a second um, copy. You know, there's no second allele to compensate. Normally, you have two alleles uh, for each trait. So again, one from mom, one from dad. If you only have one of that chromosome, one X chromosome, for instance, you're not going to have possibility of compensation. Also, sometimes haploinsufficiency is possible. So a single copy of a recessive gene, you know, may not be sufficient to provide the, the adequate function or sustain that individual. But interestingly uh, enough, we kind of like I mentioned a moment ago, plants can tolerate differences in their genome and their, their chromosomes a little better than humans. So plants actually tolerate this better and they tend to have uh, haploid pollen grains that are, they, they might be particularly sensitive and like less viable, but they still can, you know, function normally in terms of those, those ultimate plants. Now, the other side of this is instead of having one, you know, monosomy, we can have trisomy. And this is one of the ones that most people is most are, are most familiar with. This is somewhat more tolerated than monosomy. And the big example that shows, you know, that people, you know, in humans, when you have trisomy, they can end up having very functional lives uh, is Down syndrome. So the common example of trisomy is Down syndrome. It's specifically trisomy 21. So if we look at the, the karyotype here, you notice chromosome 21, there's an extra one of that, okay? So instead of having two of it, you have a third one. So that's where tri comes in, third one. And it's the only long survival trisomy example in humans is Down syndrome. But so, you know, even though it's functional, you know, it's a syndrome with a functional survival, uh, it does end up having uh, a dramatic impact. You know, sometimes you see that 
people with Down syndrome, they're more prone to respiratory disease, heart malformations, and even increased incidence of leukemia and early onset Alzheimer's. So even though you do have the option of long survival with this particular trisomy, there are complications throughout the, the life of a person with Down syndrome because of this chromosomal abnormality. Now, in addition, we can also have things like deletion occur, duplication, inversion, or translocation. And that basically means you are either deleting part of a chromosome, you are doubling up part of a chromosome. And, and when I say part, it could either, when it comes to like duplication, you could duplicate the whole thing or it's a chunk of it. So in this case, you see BC area was duplicated. Inversion means that now you can see a rearrangement. So you have a flipping of where genes are supposed to be. And then translocation is now whole segments of a chromosome could have moved to a completely new location compared to where they are supposed to be. So the first one that I mentioned there was deletions. And deletions ultimately the effect of them depends on how many bases you have removed because you might have a deletion that's just a small portion of a gene so for instance here you see only a piece of a gene is sometimes deleted sometimes it's even a single base can be deleted whereas sometimes it can be an entire gene that's deleted and boom you no longer have that gene and one of the examples of deletions in humans is Cri du Chat uh, syndrome. And Cri du Chat, that means cry of the cat in French, because when these individuals are babies, they end up making this eerie cry that's very similar to cats meowing. And so that's how it ended up getting its name. And you can see that there's a lot of... Um, changes in terms of their physical appearance, in terms of their mental abilities and, and um, expression abilities and everything. And basically, when you think of deletions, you know, you have to take into account a few things. First of all, you can lose an, a really important gene product, you know, from important enzymes from the cells, from the bodies, but also depending on where that deletion occurs, you can then mess up the entire code after it. Let's say it's just one or two bases, and we'll talk about frame shifts in a moment. Everything after that is now going to code for something completely different, and that can have very dramatic effects. Then we get to gene duplications, and this leads me to my absolute favorite mutation. And yes, I know people think I'm weird when you have a favorite mutation. Uh, I have a favorite mutation in humans, which is central heterochromia. I'll tell you about that another time. Uh, but in terms of Drosophila mutations, I love the gene duplication that leads to bar-eyed flies. Because look at this little guy. It, it ends up giving him that evil, very narrow eye compared to what it's supposed to be and then when they're rubbing their little legs together oh my god it is totally like a a villain in a movie and so the reason you end up with that bar eyed fly is because of duplications and just like i mentioned with deletions a duplication can either be a single little piece of a gene or it could be a really large piece of the chromosome okay that gets replicated more than once now in the genome and with that, you can end up with things like gene redundancy. So you can have you can have a whole lot more of a particular gene. And that can actually be a beneficial thing sometimes because you can get an abundance of a product that might be needed in the cell or the body. You can get phenotypic variation. So the bar-eyed fly suddenly looks very different. Uh, due to that duplication, duplicated region on the X chromosome. 
And ultimately, you can even get genetic variability. So it's, it can be beneficial for evolution because, you know, sometimes if a single copy of an essential gene, you know, ends up um, duplicated, then, you know, maybe one copy can be mutated without killing the organism, right? So if you now suddenly have multiple copies of an essential gene and you get a mutation that normally would have killed the organism because they needed that gene, well, now they may be safe. So it's, it's interesting how, you know, everyone's always quick to think of mutations as a bad thing, as a dangerous thing, as a scary thing. Sometimes it can actually be kind of beneficial or in the case of the bar-eyed flies, ridiculously cute. <laughs> Another type of chromosomal mutation is called an inversion. And when you're inverting part of the chromosome, what that means is you are going to have a segment of the chromosome flipped or turned around 180 degrees. So as you can see here, B, C, D, now you have D, C, V upside down flipped. Uh, over here, you notice that it includes the centromere, whereas up here you do not include the centromere, which is down there. And so the terminology here that we have different is based on whether or not the centromere is part of the inversion, part of the flipped region. So if an inversion is paracentric, that's this first one here, the centromere is not included, whereas if it's peri, it's cutting right through, that centromere, that is included in the flip. The next one that I want to mention are translocations. And with this one, you now have the movement of a chromosomal segment to a completely new location in the genome. And sometimes it's called reciprocal translocation, which can be an exchange between two non-homologous chromosomes, meaning normally, you know, if they're homologous, you can have exchanges through recombination. When it's non-homologous and you suddenly have the movement of segments, that's reciprocal translocation. Now, just like inversion, you're not actually adding or removing anything. You're just moving where genes are located, okay? But once you have meiosis occur and you've had these movements, you can end up with things basically not being what they're supposed to. Then we get to some of my favorite mutations to talk about. The first type of uh, really interesting mutation to me are the missent mutations that are base substitutions. So in the other slides that we were talking about, especially the recent ones of inversions and translocations, you have these huge portions of DNA sequences being kind of moved around or changed. In base mutations, you just have a single base, a single letter of the, the genome gets changed. Now, that can have a significant effect. Because the genetic code is what we call, you know, what we call degenerative or redundant, sometimes if you change a single letter in the gene sequence, it doesn't matter, you still code for the same protein. Fortunately, sometimes that one letter that you changed can now code for a different amino acid in the, in the next steps of, you know, having transcription and translation. So here we have what's called a missense mutation. So missense, you could think of now you're changing the sense of the sequence. You now have a single nucleotide that's been changed, either an A, T, G, or C, has suddenly been changed, and now it leads to a different amino acid. This can either end up in a conservative or a radical change. So conservative, if you think of, you know, someone who's conservative, they don't really like change, whereas radical, that's dramatic. That, that's like me, dramatic. Um, that's a big change if something's radical. So if it's a conservative missense, yes, you changed the amino acid that should be there, but the overall folding and function of that big old protein will end up the same because that new amino acid has very similar chemical and physical properties. So for instance, if 
the original amino acid was supposed to have a positive charge and the new one still has a positive charge, that's a conservative change. You won't notice much of a difference. Radical replacement is now if the missense mutation leads to a new amino acid that has a different chemical or physical property. So if you were supposed to have, let's say, a positive charge in that location, and now the new amino acid is one with a negative, that's a big difference. In this example here, it's actually a neutral charge becoming negative. And so that could really change how that ultimate protein folds, how it interacts with other things. You know, a negative charge is now going to be repelled by other negatives. It's going to be attracted to positives. So that could have a big impact. The other mutation that I find very interesting is the other form of a base substitution called a nonsense mutation. And I always shout at students, stop the nonsense, right? When you think of nonsense mutation, because now you still have just one letter getting changed in the sequence, one A, T, G, or C. But the difference here is unlike a missense, that new code is not going to code for a new amino acid. Instead, it's coding for a stop codon, okay? And this can have very dramatic effects depending on where in the gene you have this nonsense mutation. If you have it up here, well, now you have a very premature stop. You're going to end up with a truncated, much shorter protein than you're supposed to have, and the cells usually detect that and they break it down. They target it for degradation. And you may be thinking, okay, that's great. We got rid of the mutated protein. What's the problem there? You needed that protein. You needed the original full length protein. You don't have it now. Okay, so that can be a big problem for the cell. Sometimes a nonsense mutation happens right at the very end. So it ends up where it may not be as big of a problem. Okay, but ultimately nonsense, the difference between missense and nonsense is missense you now have a different amino acid. Nonsense, you now have a stop codon. Now, sometimes what you would think is a minor mutation because let's say, you know, it's just one letter. You know, what could, what could happen if you're just removing and deleting one letter? Or you're just adding one letter, maybe two letters to the gene sequence. Sounds kind of minor, doesn't it? wrong. A minor mutation can become a major problem if they cause what's called a frame shift. And what this means is a mutation can end up altering the entire rest of the reading frame after that mutation. If, for instance, the, the change that you are seeing is not divisible by three. Because when we look at gene sequences and you ultimately you know, use that DNA sequence to code for RNA and then to code for protein, sequences are read as codons of three, okay? Three bases, three letters. So if you make a change of, let's say, deleting one or two bases, you've now destroyed the reading frame of that sequence, okay? So here they deleted one of the Cs in GCC. Well, now, the cell doesn't have eyes. It's not going to say, oh, you deleted something there. Let me go back to reading it properly after that. No, it's just going to take sets of three and read on. And so now instead of GCC, it's going to read GCA, TCG, AAT. All of these are coding for a completely new sequence. If, however, the change is a set or multiple of three, the change is not as dramatic because that just means, okay, you got rid of a whole codon or added a whole codon, but everything else gets read the same way after that. Okay, so multiple of three is critical when it comes to mutations. If it's a multiple of three, like three, six, nine, 12, it may not have as severe of an impact as let's say a one, a two, a four, a five. Okay, so remember that number three. The last thing I want to mention in this lecture is the concept of mutagens. And mutagens are any agent, could be chemical or radiation or even biological, 
that causes a genetic mutation. And nowadays we're seeing more and more mutagens. We're realizing more and more things that, you know, you may have thought were safe or didn't even know existed are causing major problems. Now, the one I want you to circle star highlight is this one down here, HPV, human papillomavirus. Okay. Also make note of H. pylori. So you don't have to remember helicobacter pylori. You can call it H. pylori. These two, I want you to circle star highlight because, you know, nowadays everyone knows going out in the sun too much without sunscreen, that can cause cancer. Everyone knows x-rays. You know, you've all heard that x-rays can cause cancer, cigarette smoke, certain uh, food products and certain beauty care products. These are all things that don't surprise people as much. What surprises people, and especially what's important to note after the pandemic, is that infectious agents, viruses, bacteria, they can be mutagens. They can cause cancer. And in fact, I want you to write down in your notes that HPV is the leading cause of not only cervical cancer, but now also oral, so your mouth cancer, and rectal cancer. And I'm not going to go into the details of why that happened, why it went from just cervical to now mouth and rectal cancer. Um, you can figure that out on your own, but it shows you how, you know, so many people think of, oh, is this virus going to kill me? Oh, if it doesn't, that's not that bad, right? Wrong. A virus can be, you know, what some people say is 99.9% non-fatal. That virus should still worry you. Because the complications long term from viruses and bacteria, very scary. You know, back in the day, they thought EBV, mono, people took that very lightly. They said, oh, it's just kissing disease. You know, every college kid, every high schooler, they get that. It's no big deal. Wrong. It is a big deal. They've now realized that down the line, people who are infected with EBV have high incidence of cancers such as nasopharyngeal cancer and B-cell lymphomas. And think about it. You want your B-cells. You want your immune system. It also causes things like chronic fatigue. Another thing with infectious agents, think of all the STDs. You know, I always tell the story in microbiology and virology about when I was sitting with my grandmother watching the news and there was a story on how many people fight infertility now, how many couples want to have babies and instead they end up with miscarriage after miscarriage or the inability to get pregnant. And, you know, being old school generation, my Nana, she turned to me and she said, you know, it's because of all of these young people, they're just having sex with everyone before they're married, you know, no selectivity. She's like, yeah, there's just all that sex before marriage. And, you know, it's an old school way of thinking and phrasing it. But in a way, she wasn't completely wrong. Infertility rates have skyrocketed because of the fact that when you have so many partners, okay, there's a lot, you know, we have so much access thanks to dating apps, social media, cell phones, you know, there's a lot of access to quick and easy sexual interactions. You increase the amount of partners, you increase the amount of STDs and multiple of those STDs, such as the big ones like gonorrhea, chlamydia, they cause infertility because even though some people are asymptomatic and they don't realize symptoms on the outside. Or even though some people, you know, you take an antibiotic for some of them, you, you feel better. They don't realize the damage and scarring that it does on the inside. So a lot of the reproductive pathways end up scarred with heavy scar tissue there. And if you think about what pregnancy is and the need to implant, you know, that, that the, the developing embryo, you can't have that with the major scar tissue and damage. So these are the things to, to think about when you take infections very lightly. Look at the COVID pandemic. The numbers of people who now have what's called POTS or postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome has skyrocketed, skyrocketed from COVID, okay? Because that can be triggered by viruses. That's a really brutal autonomic nervous system dysfunction that now many people within the population, especially women in the age groups of 16 to about 46, will have for the rest of their lives because they got that virus, COVID. And they might not have even been that sick with COVID, or they might have even been asymptomatic. But viruses can do a lot of things long-term in your body. Think about how 
people were losing their sense of smell and taste with COVID during the pandemic. That tells you which body system does that affect? Your nervous system. That's a little scary, don't you think? So I just want to emphasize to my students to take viruses, take bacteria, take infections very seriously because, you know, you only get one body, you only get one lifetime. And the things that you do when you're younger and think that you're invincible, they catch up to you down the line. So you may not be thinking about having kids right now, but when you do one day, if you made the wrong choices early on, you've now lost that ability or you have to fight a lot harder for it. Or you may have taken things like the pandemic not very seriously or when, you know, your, your sexual activity is not very seriously because you think, oh, there's medicine for that or, oh, it's not that bad. You, you heal up right away. Down the line, when you are struggling and suffering with issues like POTS or cancer, you suddenly realize how important it was to be careful when you were younger. Okay, so please keep those things in mind. Circle star highlight the infectious agents and really emphasize that in your notes. Okay, now that I've made you all depressed and question your life choices, I know I've made a lot of poor choices that I question too. Um, I'm going to leave you with today's review question. Please send me the answer in the Remind app or if you're not in one of my classes through email, which is listed on my channel's uh, bio info. For this review question, I'm asking you which of the following would be most deleterious or more, most dangerous, and I want you to explain why. And please make sure to send me a picture of the slide when you answer this question. That's it for today. Thank you so much and have a great day.